the dome in the Hagia Sophia and its architecture of light. The Hagia Sophia. It is perhaps the most admired church in the world and has been setting new standards of excellence in architecture, in size, in the art and materials adorning the spaces within its interior, and finally, because of its dome, its crown and glory, for almost 1,500 years. This dome is 180 feet high and 108 feet in diameter. Built in the years 532 AD to 537 in Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, for almost a thousand years it was the largest church in the world. Only the pyramids were taller. If the Statue of Liberty was placed inside the Hagia Sophia and her torch was directly beneath the dome, it was just scraped the top of it. Perhaps it is the dome that the Hagia Sophia is best known for, for both the innovative ways in which it was designed and built and for its extraordinary beauty and light. 200 years before the Hagia Sophia was built, Emperor Constantine made it illegal to persecute Christians for their beliefs in 313 AD. Although he did not formally legalize Christianity, this tolerance was his hallmark and provided the way for the beginning of Christianity as a formally recognized religion. He then needed a building design for the early church. Instead of the design used for temples devoted to pagan worship, he chose the Basilica, a building that had previously been used by everyone for civic and public functions or for courts of law. The Basilica was rectangular and had a wide aisle down the center of its structure. On either side of the aisle were naves, and this combination included a semicircular apse at the end of the aisle. Two centuries later, when Justinian was emperor, he found himself with a demolished church after riots broke out, and he decided to build a church like no other had ever been built before, as a tribute to Christianity. Justinian too liked the basilica as a foundational structure for the new church, and he liked the round shape of the Pantheon. He wanted to place a dome like the one on the Pantheon on top of the rectangular building, but how could he do this? He hired two men who were scientists, mathematicians, and physicists to design the structure of the church, and Themius and Isidora the Elder figured out how to put a round dome on a rectangular base. They designed the dome to be supported by arches and two semi-domes on either side of, of the dome. The semi-domes were created on the ceiling to support the structure of the dome and to distribute the weight evenly, taking the sole burden off the central dome. These semi-domes were also supported by smaller semi-domes. They decided that the central dome would sit very lightly on top of the arches, but there was a problem. The weight of the dome pushed the support of the arches outward, causing them to give way. They added massive piers at the bottom, placed in the shape of a square on the floor to serve as buttresses, which would support the arches and would also prevent that outward movement. Finally, they placed triangular shaped structures that were upside down above the piers to fill in the gaps and to provide even more fortification. These triangular shaped structures were called pendentives and they helped to channel the weight of the dome sitting very lightly on the arches down through the piers. The church when it was finished had four huge arches, four giant piers, two semi-domes, four pendentives, which closed the circle in the square, and 40 windows. The 40 windows were at the base of the dome, and not only did the windows make the dome lighter in weight, it added a way for light to stream into the church. The result was unprecedented and stunning. The Byzantine Empire's court historian, Procopius, in 537 AD, 
said that the dome of the church looked as if it was suspended from heaven by a golden chain. He also wrote that it seemed as if the church was illuminated from within instead of without, and the church is indeed known as much for its mystical light as it is for the dome itself. Procopius wrote, For it proudly reveals its mass and the harmony of its proportions, having neither any excess nor deficiency, since it is both more pretentious than the buildings to which we are accustomed, and considerably more noble than those which are merely huge, and it abounds exceedingly in sunlight and in the reflection of the sun's rays from the marble. Indeed, one might say that its interior is not illuminated from without by the sun, but that the radiance comes into being within it, such an abundance of light bathes this shrine. In the first page of her book, Hagia Sophia and the Byzantine Aesthetic Experience, art historian and professor Nadine Shabil writes about the aesthetic experience of the interior of the building and the art and stone adorning that space, as well as the reactions to it through ekphrasis, or the literary response to the church and its interior. She writes, The central aesthetic feature that emerges from 6th century ekphrasis of Hagia Sophia is that of light. Light is described as the decisive element in the experience of the sacred space, and light is simultaneously associated with the notion of wisdom. It is argued that the concepts of light and wisdom are interwoven programmatic elements that underlie the unique architecture and non-figurative decoration of Hagia Sophia. The Hagia Sophia is built on a fault line, the Anatolia fault line, and 20 years later after its first reception, the dome partially collapsed because of an earthquake. The original builders and designers were dead, so Justinian hired Isidora's nephew, Isidora the Younger, to redesign the dome. He did this, and this is the structure the Hagia Sophia has today. It has been vulnerable to many earthquakes, and an ongoing effort is made to refortify its structure, especially the structure of the dome, to prevent further damage to the dome and the church. The Hagia Sophia has been inspiring awe for almost 1,500 years. It has served as inspiration and a model for both Christian churches and Muslim mosques. It became a mosque in 1453, in fact, after the Ottoman conquest, and is now a museum. Before this, though, the Hagia Sophia inspired the designs of other mosques. The Suleiman Mosque was said to be a quotation of the Hagia Sophia, and the Blue Mosque was modeled after it as well. Both mosques are in Istanbul. The Hagia Sophia is the oldest, however, and her reign will go down in history as a symbol of religious tolerance for the sheer size of the church and for the beautiful and majestic dome accommodating ribbons of light which flood the interior every day. Finally, the Hagia Sophia is a poetic reminder that humanity can soar to great heights with noble achievements, and it is also a beautiful testament that it's already been done. This video has been produced for the Department of Art History at Portland State University, and more specifically for a class on Byzantine art history taught by Professor Anne McLannan. I'm Carrie Buckley.